And today we're doing an interview with Tiffany Dawn. She is just deconstructing the good girl. I've had uh, the pleasure of speaking with Tiffany already for her podcast. And I thought what a great opportunity to have her uh, talk with me and we could share a little bit about uh, her journey and deconstructing out of the Christian bubble and my listeners could get a chance to find out who she is. And so um, she does more than podcasting. She's quite a YouTuber. She has been a nationally uh, recognized speaker and, and done a bunch of that. And she writes that Outgrowing the Good Christian Girl podcast is about her faith journey from a black and white view of God in the Bible to under, a new understanding of Christianity. So thank you so much, Tiffany, for being here and um, oh, welcome. Thank you for having me. I loved having you on my podcast. I might ask you to repeat a couple things too that you said on my podcast, but yeah, I had so much fun and I'm excited to be here with you today. Wonderful. So yeah, um, one of the things I wanted to kind of discuss with you, which I haven't really considered for a while on my podcast is a little bit about the journey of what happens when you've been raised in a sort of a sheltered environment, mm -hmm. uh, a culturally sheltered environment. And this can happen in a variety of ways, but your story is, is a little bit similar to mine in, in the mm -hmm. sense of a fairly Christian mm -hmm. bubble yeah, <laughs> that you're part absolutely. of. Um, and what you wind up doing now is sharing a lot of resources on Re relating um, to others in relationships and dating and faith and then what it looks like to s when you start um, asking questions and mm -hmm. that pulls you away from what you've known into mm -hmm. some of the unknown. Um, yeah. Maybe you can talk a little bit about how you began podcasting three years ago about this part of your life. Yeah, yeah. You know, I was raised similar to you, as we've learned. Um, I was homeschooled the whole way through until college and went to a very conservative evangelical church in upstate New York. And my whole life was the Christian bubble. I mm -hmm. didn't really have a world outside that. Um, after college, I got into ministry and was traveling around the U.S. speaking, talking about recovering from an eating disorder and um, very much a God loves me. God makes me enough. Um, when I surrender all to him, that's when I find freedom. That was kind of my message. And there's a lot of good stuff in there, mm -hmm. but um, it's a little simplistic too, uh, looking back. And so I started a YouTube channel after I got married and again, focusing on this, you know, talked a lot about sex and saving sex for marriage, talked a lot about the traditional Christian ethos. And I tried to do it in a more nuanced way, but it really was coming from that place. And again, a lot of good there. But um, a few years ago, I started really questioning everything. Um, mm. It started slowly, but someone very close to me came out as trans about 10 years ago. And this mm. person had been very depressed, borderline suicidal, mm. and had very antisocial behavior, um, mm. never wanted a picture taken, mm. had tremors in their hands, always shaking. And my thought at first was, this is another phase. This person has gone through a lot of phases. There was a summer when this person wore three piece suits every day all summer long. There was a summer they were really into selling cut coat knives. You know, like this is another phase. They're trying wow. to fill this hole that only God can fill. Mm -hmm. And then I watched and I watched as I saw a lot of good fruit good outcomes. I know people are like fruit isn't necessarily a good outcome, but I think they, there are differences, but I do think they also overlap a lot of times. Right. I saw the tremors that she'd had her whole life go away. Mm -hmm. I saw her come out of her antisocial behavior and start making real friendships, actually mm -hmm. taking care of herself, actually wearing deodorant. I watched mm -hmm. her no longer being depressed, like laughing, finding mm -hmm. life again. And it wasn't a short term change. It was like, this has been 10 years now. This person still identifies now as a woman, used to be a man. And I've seen long-term positive change. And that messed with my head because it went against everything I had been taught and believed my whole life. Um, I never would have like 
told somebody in the LGBTQ community like this is wrong, but I would have thought it. And I would have thought like, they're still trying to fill this hole that only God can fill. And Mm -hmm. so as I'm watching this, I'm like, why is so much good coming from this? And then I'm, like I said, have this platform that's very much rooted in this traditional Christian ethic um, of, I don't even know if I should say traditional because it it was a traditional evangelical Christian Mm -hmm. ethic because Christianity is so much Mm -hmm. bigger than that. We like forget that. Um, But in this very evangelical ethic and um, my whole platform is rooted in that. And as I'm wrestling with this and trying to figure out, is there another way to understand scripture on this topic? Because scripture has Mm -hmm. always been like authoritative in my life and it still is. And so I'm like, I have to like figure out like, even though this has not, would make no change in my life. I remember talking to my therapist and he's like, why do you have to know the answer? I'm like, because I have to be a good Christian who has an answer to everything. Like there was this idea that that's what it means to be a Christian instead of this idea that Christians wrestle with God, with scripture and community and have that humility. Instead, it was like this, I have to have an answer. And he's like, it won't change your life at all though. And I'm like, well, yeah. But I still have to know. Anyway, (laughs) so I'm wrestling with this. I'm trying to figure out, is there another way to look at scripture? And in the middle of all that, which was super uncomfortable, I did not want to go down that road, but I felt I couldn't, I was like inexplicably pulled toward it and I could not shake it. I like started running away from my quiet times with God because it was there in front of my face every time I slowed down. And I was so uncomfortable. I felt like Mm. I'm being deceived. I'm being led astray. Why do I keep asking this? I'm so uncomfortable. I liked my faith the way it was before, Um, but I could not stop. It was like looking back, I'm like, God was calling to my spirit through these questions. Like Mm -hmm. I was afraid of them, but it was God calling to my spirit and bringing me deeper. So anyway, um, feel free to interrupt me at any point because I talk a lot. <laughs> um, but so I'm like going through all this wrestling and I remember feeling like God put this YouTube video idea on my heart hmm. and I could not sleep at night because I did not want to make this video. And the hmm. video idea, I felt like it was like this whole outline just came into my head mm-hmm. and it was like a video called Am I Gay? Mm -hmm. And it would start by saying, here are resources from people who believe it is not okay to be in a gay relationship biblically and people who believe it is okay biblically. Mm -hmm. And then it would go into the the rest of the video. I had this whole outline and I was like, God, there is one topic I have never wanted to touch with a 10 foot pole. And this is the Uh... one. It is so controversial. I don't know what I believe about this. I don't want to make this video. Mm -hmm. And I could not sleep. For like three weeks until I finally said, okay, I'll do it. I just, and I couldn't understand like, why is God putting this on my heart? And it's nothing I ever wanted to do or talk about. It's nothing my audience was looking for me to do or talk <laughs> about. You know, I know I'm going to lose hundreds or thousands of followers talking uh, about this. Right. Like, why is God putting this on mm. my heart when it's got to be sin? That's what I was thinking. And huh. I made the video and I lost a ton of followers. I remember one lady (laughs) writing this comment like, I live in India and we have actual martyrs here and you're just trying to be cool. And I remember thinking, lady, I did not want to make this video and I did not expect to be cool from it. (laughs) Like, if you want to be cool, you don't talk about this in Christian Mm -hmm. circles. Mm -hmm. So, but I started hearing from people who it really touched and just like lifted some shame. People who were Mm -hmm. asking these questions and, Mm -hmm. um, And doing the research for that led me to some people like Matthew Vines of the Reformation Project who believed it is okay and had a biblical argument for why it's okay to be in a same-sex relationship. And that led Mm -hmm. me to Matthew Vines and Karen Keene and their research and scholarship and Mm -hmm. books and coming, you know, seeing the Bible from that authoritative perspective, but coming to very different conclusions than I had. Mm -hmm. And the more I studied it, people thought I was going to lose my salvation. (laughs) But the more I studied it, the more I was like, I have to talk about this. It was like this weight on me. Like, again, not what I was going for with my platform, (laughs) but it was like, I have to talk about this. And then all these other questions start coming up. What do I believe about heaven and hell? What about evangelism, salvation, women in the church? What about sin? What about, you know, social justice? There were like all these questions. And I, again, was very uncomfortable. It was not fun walking through that, but it was like, I could not say no. It felt like, honestly, I felt like saying no would be saying no to God. Like, I know that sounds really crazy, but 
Well, let me speak to that for one yeah. second. Um, this this thing that um, like gets under our skin, I think yeah. that God is up to, to um, that we we keep getting in a sense prodded by the Spirit to to do maybe something that we're unsure about it. That's a little maybe dangerous to the status quo for us mm. because it's our growing edge. Mm -hmm. But it is also, I think, always tied up in in the gospel, which is that mm. the gospel comes to us from the margins, the outcast, mm. you know, the, the outcast have something to tell us about what God is up to in the world. And that. so when the outcast have not been received by the community because no, mm. they're sinners or they're wrong, or, you know, we're not going to associate with them. Then God will put them on our minds. You know, God mm. will say, well, what about them? Do I love them? Of course, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. let's hear from them. Let's let's hear about their heart and their wounds. And what does the Bible say about who God loves? Mm -hmm. And I think yeah. that that's the spirit's work. And, and we mm -hmm. can wrestle with it and fight it. But it is like wrestling ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. because um, we'll be a little tormented till we yes. come into an agreement with the spirit, which is to say, go out in faith to the places you don't know, mm -hmm. you know, seek me the whole time, pray the yeah, whole time. Yeah. Um, we're not talking about, you know, starting to go to like occult meetings or, you know, <laughs> we're not, we're not saying right. go wild, but start asking questions, start yeah. listening to people who, who love the Lord differently, mm -hmm. but yeah. love the Lord. And yeah. I, I think that that's, that's the one thing that can be instilled a lot of fear in, in the bubbles mm -hmm. are don't read these books. Don't listen to these people. If this mm -hmm. person's saying this, they're deceiving you. Mm -hmm. if, and there's a lot of, it's a lot of fear based, not a lot of love based love yeah. coming from God. Lo God will protect you. God loves you. God wants the best for you. There's mm -hmm. a lot of, I think, man-made fear. I don't know if you, right. is that something you kind of ran into as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's funny because yeah, like you were saying, there's, there's all this pressure, like don't read these books, anyone who believes this. And that was the thing. It was like LGBTQ plus was the issue that decided yeah. whether or not you were a real Christian. And the more yeah. I studied it, the more I'm like, I don't understand why. Like the Bible does not talk a lot about it to start with, but also like there are people who love God, who have a genuine relationship with God, who, who I like, who are in same-sex relationships and believe they're honoring God in scripture and they have a reason why they have studied yeah. scripture. And so like, why can't we have the freedom to agree to disagree and let people work out their salvation with fear and trembling, you know? And I, I just started being more and more to be like, why is this the issue when Jesus said the issue is to love God, love others and love ourselves? Like mm. we have mixed up our issues of what mm. makes you a true Christian. Mm. And even just following the fruits of the spirit, like in my mind, it was like, it felt very scary. Like it reminded me of God calling Abraham to an unknown land. It felt like that in my faith. Uh -huh. And it's not because this is an unknown land. Like the path is well worn by saints through the ages, but it's not well marked. <laughs> and so I think for me, it was like the fruits of the spirit are like guideposts. And so what do I see coming up in my life through this? And I saw freedom and Jesus is a liberator. Mm -hmm. I saw joy. I saw peace. I saw love. Like I saw really good fruit. And that is fruit that the spirit of God brings. So mm -hmm. that was my sign. Like, even though this feels scary and foreign, like I'm on the right track here. And that's mm -hmm. not to say everybody's track is going to look the same or that everybody has to believe the same thing on these issues, mm -hmm. but that we can look to the spirit to guide us. I think like mm -hmm. for me, there was almost this idea. I didn't realize at the time, but I was like worshiping my understanding of scripture. And it was like, it's clear in the Bible. The Bible plainly says this. You just do what it says. And there was no real biblical literacy when it came to like, the context historically or who it was mm. actually written to and mm. the revolutionary waves it was making in that culture mm. and the intent of the passage. Um, but it was just like, it's clear. You don't even need to read other books, just read it, which is mm. in retrospect, very arrogant, but that's what I thought. Mm. And um, to realize like there's actually biblical precedent for rethinking our theology. Like you see, 
Peter and all, you know, the unclean animals. And he gets this vision from God. I would have felt like I was crazy. Like, no, these animals are sinful to eat. And then I have a vision and it's okay, you know? And, but like, there's that precedent of like following the spirit of God. Again, not that you're like going off the deep end, but it all comes back to what Jesus said. Like, we love God. We love others. We love ourselves. Like that is the heart of it all. Mm -hmm. And and there's biblical precedent for people having, agreeing to disagree, like with mm -hmm food sacrifice to idols. And Paul's like, one of you believes this and one of you believes this and follow your conscience, you know, mm. and respect each other's convictions on that. So mm. I just, um, yeah, I think like I became more and more felt drawn to talk about these things because mm. I felt like nobody was sharing the other side of the story. Not that nobody was, but in my circle, mm -hmm. there was no like, well, here's what people believe biblically and why they believe this way that's different than what we always grew up with mm -hmm. and i started thinking this is so important to have that diversity mm -hmm. of theological perspectives not just like making it up out of thin air but from biblical scholarship and like mm -hmm. trying to understand the intent of the people who wrote these passages and how these would have been read from the you know jewish perspective back in the day in another mm -hmm. language and another culture and how much that plays into it and that started showing me a totally different side of scripture and um, it became much more freeing and less legalistic to me. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was kind of my start. Yeah. Right, right. And then since then, you've, I've watched most of the things that you have out there and, and then you've covered a bunch of different topics. You've covered heaven yeah. and hell. Um, you've covered women's roles in the church and, mm -hmm. um, sex, uh, purity culture, and um, there's a lot of things that we can, we can just kind of in, ingest and absorb them and think, well, it's just clear in the Bible. It's just right mm -hmm. there. And right. We're not realizing that anytime someone's telling us something that's in the Bible, it's through a lens of interpretation. Yes. And that it's, if it's, if they're not a scholar, for instance, which mm -hmm. few, few, people are mm -hmm. they don't really have the historical context or the background they're telling you what maybe they've heard or what they hope is true but are they really going back to um is it is it like reading somebody else's mail mm -hmm. or is it um you know people will assume well this must mean this applies to everyone it's like mm -hmm. well was it a letter to a specific church about a specific problem right but in reality the context was different and, you know, like, as far as like the role of women in the church, yeah. how has your view shifted or what else has come into your consciousness about that? Yeah. Well, I think first I'll say I am not a scholar and in, <laughs> and um, for the listeners and in, in all my yeah. podcasts, I have other people coming on and talking about these who are scholars in these areas. Yeah. And I think like I have this personality where uh, when I'm studying something, I'm like taking it all in and absorbing it. And then it changes how I feel on an issue. Mm -hmm. And then I just kind of forget why, like I forget all the details <laughs> about why it changed. I just remember how I feel about it. So right. um, as I'm talking about this, I think, I, I think that's important to remember too, because there's this idea that Christianity is about what we know and having an mm. argument for stuff. And that's something right. I really had to let go of that. There's mm. this freedom to be okay with not knowing, to not mm. fully understand things. Mm. But I think women in the church is a great example of this because um the church I was raised in was actually very, um, I guess you could say more progressive in this area. Women mm -hmm. couldn't be pastors, but mm -hmm. they could do other things, um, which for even, might sound not very progressive at all, but <laughs> in the culture <laughs> I was raised in, I would say it was. And so mm -hmm. like when I was 13, my youth pastor had me up giving messages at youth group and he like oh. coached me in it. It was amazing. And my church was very encouraging. Mm -hmm. Then when I was 17, I started dating this guy who seemed amazing this great Christian who really knew his Bible. And I remember him telling me, I don't know why God gave you all these gifts because you're a woman. You can never use them. Oof. And I started going to church with him. And mm -hmm. in his church, women wore head coverings. Mm -hmm. um, and like in the communion service, women couldn't even sing. Like you had to be silent. The oh. men could stand up and pray. The men could lead the singing, but the women mm -hmm. had to be silent. Mm -hmm. Um for Sunday school, you couldn't teach Sunday school for 10 years old because then you might accidentally be teaching a man. And right, I kind of pushed right. back, um, but he had all the biblical 
reasons and arguments for why this was true and going back to creation and blah, blah, blah. And I did not have the arguments, Mm. but I felt dead inside. The fruit I saw from that was not the fruit of the spirit. It was death and not abundant life. And I felt like I was almost turning myself off to God. It was like, Mm. oh, I can't pray in the car unless if I can find a tissue to put on my head as a head covering. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I can't lead the Christian group anymore. He gave me this ultimatum. Like you can't be Mm. the president of the Christian group on campus at college or we're going to break up. Like that's not okay. You know, I have to, there's all this stuff and the fruit was bad, but I thought, Christianity was about what I knew in my head. And so I went with what I knew in my head and I ignored the fruit. And Mm -hmm. when I finally broke up with him, when I was like 19 or maybe I was Mm -hmm. 18 and a half or something, um, I remember saying like, God, if you are who this guy said you are, I want nothing to do with you. I'm done. Mm -hmm. And I felt like, you know, God kept pulling my heart back. And for the several years, I remember I I started, you know, speaking more and stuff like that. And I didn't know why it was okay. And that felt heretical. Like I should understand the theology before I do this. But I kept Mm. saying, God, if you want me to stop, I will stop. But I don't feel like you're telling me that. And I feel like the fruit of me speaking is life and it's from your spirit. And so I'm going to do it. I remember speaking at this Christian camp um, that was super conservative. And some of the girls coming up and saying, not to be mean or anything. We're just curious. Like, why do you think it's okay for a woman to be the chapel speaker here? And I was like, honestly, Um, I don't have the theological argument right now. All mm -hmm. I know is that I was silent. I was dead inside. And when I speak, it brings life. Mm -hmm. And if God asks me to stop, I will. So Mm -hmm. it was years before I really understood the theology. I knew people would say it was just cultural, but I didn't really understand why, you know? Uh And it was it was several more years until I really started understanding how radical Paul's message was toward Mm -hmm. women in a progressive way. Like Mm -hmm. I had always taken it like the intent of these passages about women is to put them in their place. I didn't understand that like he's bringing women into his letters and addressing them and how radical that was in the day. Like he was progressing the role of women, not bringing it back again. And so Mm -hmm. like that intent was like, mind-blowing like what Mm. a shift like we're reading these verbatim Mm -hmm. quote-unquote literal interpretation but we're missing the whole point of what paul was doing like you can read the bible literally and miss the whole point because the bible Mm. is not the static words written that we worship as an idol it is life Mm. it is god breathed it is two specific times and it's for an intent speaking into that culture but for Mm. And intent is the intent is not always that we follow the exact literal words forever. Anyway, so like mm-hmm. once I started understanding that, and there's podcast episodes I have that do a deep dive. Um, I have this season coming out later this summer, um, Dr. Cynthia Hester, who has a course called Theology of Women. And she just talks about the verses we get this from. Mm-hmm. And she breaks down like the context, the Greek, the, mm-hmm. you know, Greek or Hebrew, whatever it was. I don't mm-hmm. even know. I'm not a scholar. But um, and she like breaks it all down and talks about it and brings in other scripture passages. And mm-hmm. it's like, mind blowing, but (laughs) just a totally different understanding. But I think, yeah, I think it's important to pay attention to Like we've been taught almost, I think in conservative circles to not trust our gut, to not trust Mm. our feelings. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. feelings are not to be trusted, but feelings are an important messenger. Like, Mm. yeah, they're not the only thing we base decisions on, but they can tell us when something is wrong that we don't yet have words or theology for. And we need to listen to them more or or honor them more. Again, not that we base all our decisions on feelings. Mm. Feelings do come and go, but they also can tell us a lot. So, right. yeah. Does that kind think, of answer your question? Sure. I, you know, it's also important to say that feelings and thoughts are never actually separated from each other. When we mm. have thoughts, we always have feelings, and when we have feelings, we always have thoughts. And it's mm. this false dichotomy to think that that the one happens without the other. Mm. Um, how our brain works just it just isn't so. It might feel more passionate thoughts, mm. you know, or they might feel less passionate thoughts, but they are happening same time and and one of the things um we notice very very obviously in the church is that as it gets further from jesus's time it gets more like the oppressive culture that that surrounds christianity so as Mm -hmm. as constantine 
uh, takes over and the, the Roman Empire takes over, it looks extremely like uh, different things in government where men are in control and mm -hmm. women have to be are, are sidelined instead of the house churches where women were hosting church, mm -hmm. you know, in, in their homes. These were home churches and the women were were inviting people into their homes, which was considered in, in the cultural time, that was their domain. Mm. And the church was their domain. That's what was so hmm. world ending and 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 uh why some of the reasons why Christians were so tormented and persecuted is because they were upsetting the entire society of which mm. they were a part of. They were they were doing everything. They were irreligious compared to the you know, not worshiping Caesar. They were the women were in charge. It was just insane, mm. and so you gotta you gotta kill these people off. You know, mm. so the fact that women weren't involved is so opposite of what's yes. happening that it's it's wild to think that it would go completely the other direction. Yeah. And yeah. one of the consistencies that's really easy to see, and this was brought to my attention in when I was in seminary, and I was I was up for I was recommended to get a scholarship that I could apply for. But what nobody wanted to mention out loud and I found out like hint hint was it wasn't available for women because I mm. couldn't be a pastor in my denomination, which mm. I was not interested in being a pastor. However, I was told that if I wanted to be a missionary, I could qualify. Mm. So it was okay for me to speak and teach and have authority over non-white men interesting so wow. like we have to realize how much this is usually true in very conservative evangelical circles that women as missionaries are suddenly given some authority over men why would that mm -hmm. be maybe because they're not white because they don't look like they're othered you know they're they're not wow. the same as us let's be let's be real about what's happening here why would they have the authority yeah. but not at home and that would just somehow change and that's really when i th start thinking there's something really gross about that <laughs> Yeah. I'm uh -huh. not here to change how things went. They can spend their money and their scholarship money how they want. But I had someone who was kind of an advocate, um, saw, saw the problem here. And this man who was the financial aid guy, long after I stopped, I, I graduated and everything, every single year he'd bring this up. And mm. this went on for maybe seven or eight years. And one day, the same committee who offers these scholarships, there were two women finally on this scholarship board. Wow. And he said, do you still want to only offer this to men? And the men in the group put their heads down. Oh. And the two women went, excuse me? I didn't realize this was just for men. Oh, are, we only, are, are we only letting men have this? I'm not, I wasn't aware. And the men are like, uh, they had been there. And, and, this, and, and my friend says, well, it's only available to men because there's only male pastors, but you could open it up to the counseling majors, which are men and women. And I think that would be probably the most fair thing to do. Well, the women were appalled that it had been <laughs> sexist, but yeah. no one had said only available to men because that would seem terrible. Right. And it was just so interesting that once women were represented yeah. at all and could be part of the conversation, it could have there could justice could happen mm. and i think that that's that's kind of you know when you keep when you keep certain people out and and that's to say that who are we keeping out of, of the decisions mm -hmm. are we keeping people out like are we keeping the future leaders out mm. the youth are we keeping people who don't look like us out of those decisions mm. people we're ministering mm. to but aren't like us like when we reach the poor to the poor are the poor part of the decision makers or mm. are they just the served who are, mm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. and I think we yeah. do a lot of this stuff or, or yeah. the disabled, like, are we making decisions for them mm. or are they part of the decision making? And that is really a different way of, I think what God is up to. Yeah. And some of these disruptive things, they seem really disruptive, especially yeah. if you're the one in control, mm -hmm. but there are shakeups because God is shaking things up, right? Yeah, yeah, which is very exciting and uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. both. It's yeah, both. exactly. So, yeah. yeah, with and 
what are some what are some other things that you feel that you wish you had known and you wish you had had the freedom to to shift on or to believe or you know what have you softened on if you can think of any examples i think the biggest thing for me is just recognizing that things are not as black and white as i thought and part mm. of this is because mm-hmm. of the culture i was raised in and part of it is my personality some personalities oh, tend yeah. toward black and white thinking and i am one of those um but I always thought there's a right and wrong answer for all of these hot topic issues. And I don't think that anymore. Mm-hmm. I am much more strongly like we need to hear and honor both sides of the story. There's more than one way to understand the Bible. There's more than one way to believe on these different issues. And we need to be very careful when we say that people are out, like for example, the LGBTQ plus community, because we can do immense damage with scripture and use it as a weapon Mm -hmm. if we don't take the time to hear both sides and understand it. And that doesn't mean you have to believe the same as everybody else, but to be able to respect that they believe differently and for good reason, the scripture is still important to them. God is working in their lives. They love Jesus and they believe it's okay to be in a same-sex relationship, for example, or to have a woman pastor or Mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And I think for me, just realizing that things are much more nuanced Mm -hmm. is the biggest difference in my faith, but also like it brings so much freedom. Like, it's just like, I don't have to know. Mm -hmm. I don't have to have this definitive answer for all time and space. And like, God is much bigger than that. Yeah. That has Mm -hmm. brought so much comfort to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say that's the biggest, the biggest difference. Well, for like a taste test of what's upcoming, what are some of the things, like who are some of the people or some of the topics that are upcoming for this new series? Oh, okay. Yeah. So we (laughs) talked about heaven and hell in the last season and those episodes were a freaking amazing. So you should (laughs) definitely check them out. Mm -hmm. Um, But this time we're doing, the season three is called A Deconstruction life. So we've wrestled with some of these hard questions. We've maybe changed our theology in different areas. So how do we live our lives? So we're talking, the first three episodes are all about theology. How do we know what to believe? How do we understand scripture? Um, So we've got a reverend coming on. We have Marty Solomon of the Bema podcast who um, has studied with Jewish rabbis and has got an incredible podcast. We have Pastor Trey Ferguson who wrote the book, mm-hmm. Theologize and Bigger. Um, and it's all about how do we create theology and understand scripture? Then we go into church, reimagining church. So there's this idea of what is church even meant to be? Because I think every mm-hmm. part of our faith, when we take it to the legalistic extreme, it does no longer brings life. We could rob it of its power. Mm -hmm. Um, And so what, let's dream, you know, what could this look like? Um, Then we have Brittany Moses coming on. She's, um, she does a lot of, talks a lot about trauma therapy and psychology. So she's talking the psychology of deconstruction and healing from religious trauma. So Mm -hmm. why is it so uncomfortable when we deconstruct? Why do we feel like so triggered in certain spaces and how do we heal? Mm -hmm. Um, Then we have a whole section on controversial issues. We've got women in the church. We've got LGBTQ plus Karen Keene who wrote, um, oh goodness, um, now I'm for the name of her amazing book, but she has like courses about sexual ethics. Like we talk about mm-hmm. premarital sex. What does the Bible say about it? LGBTQ plus. What does the Bible say about that? Then we have somebody coming on who's a friend of mine, um, who's a PK, youngest of seven kids was homeschooled and she has come out as being a queer Christian. And so she's sharing her story and how she feels like God has put a call on her heart to build bridges, not to try and convert people to believe certain ways, but to build bridges mm-hmm. and help people see that we're different, but not that different because what we want at the core is the same. We want to love God and love others and ourselves. So, Mm -hmm. so she's talking about her journey with that. Um, And then later in the season, we're talking about parenting, like spanking, self-esteem in girls, Mm -hmm. all these things. Mm -hmm. Um, We're talking about devotions with you, like how to kind of refresh your spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Scott, we are talking about marriage and divorce. We have um, Gina Otiende coming on and she talks about um, even the idea of God as they. A lot of people have heard Christians referring to God as they. And so she, part of our interview is like, why is that? Like, where does that come from biblically? And so she talks about that too, just in passing, but that's an interesting little part of her episode. Um, 
but yeah, so we got a whole bunch of stuff, but it's all about <laughs> living our lives now after all these questions and saying, do I need to have different theology? And even if I don't, how can I honor people and honor God's work in their lives when mm. we believe different things? Right. So, yeah, That's, that is great. And it's also just important in a time when division kind of rules the day with everything. Mm. There's yeah. There's fights about everything. You know, we have an election year coming. Yay. Yes. Uh, and, and it's just like, there's so many things that divide us as Christians. When, when we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, believe mm. that we are reconciled to God through Jesus. If we could stick to some of those major things that we know that the kingdom of God is here, we are yeah. reinventing the world as God's dream. Mm. Then let's get on the same page and let some of the stu other stuff go yeah and and move toward fulfilling the kingdom mm -hmm. of god right and mm -hmm. because there's so many things we could be divided on and we've mm -hmm. they've been very distracting yes yes you know, from the main point yeah way too distracting and i think that that's you know that is um how we're torn down that's how the enemy works is like mm. let's get you distracted and and uh, irritated at each other and then yeah. you're not gonna have any energy to do what good in the world and love people yeah and that's one of the things too we're covering that i forgot to say shane claiborne is coming on and he worked with mother Teresa. he's been in prison for his work um yeah. he's amazing and so he's coming on to talk about politics and pro-life so that'll be a fun one yeah. fun episode too wow. yeah it's a full slate. You yeah, it'll be awesome. It starts June 1st. So cool, yeah, cool. that's neat. And then I guess based on your experience, what advice do you have for people who've lived in a Christian bubble? Maybe they didn't even realize it, but as mm. they've been exposed to more books or more people and, and began to emerge from that just in adulthood, maybe yeah. they're even feeling guilty about discovering things or, or feeling like, oh, maybe I'm not a company man now that I'm yeah. wondering about other things or going outside what's familiar. How do you think people should navigate that? Okay. Can I have you share something from your interview? Because this just like was so profound to me, the transplanting and the first and second naivete. When you said this in your podcast interview with me, I was like, oh, that's so good. Yeah, do you mind like kind of like sharing that a little bit? If that's okay. I'm you pretty remember. sure what you're, I'm pretty sure what you're, what you're referring to is that I, I enjoy talking about deconstruction as like a transplanting of mm -hmm. a root bound plant into a bigger pot or into nature where mm -hmm. it can really grow and flourish. And that that can sometimes when you're doing it with a plant, it can feel like a shock and a death. Mm -hmm. And it really is a rebirth and a, a um, beginning of new life and new leaves and new blooms. Mm -hmm. But that, it's necessary like the the plant will will be stunted and unhealthy and unwell so you have to really do that if you care about mm. your plants right so i yeah. think god calls us into transplanting when we have these little pots which might be very important when you're just mm. a little vulnerable seedling right yeah. <laughs> so i loved that and the idea of how important those pots are when you're small like it's easy to think, why did I ever believe that way? Why did I ever think that way? But to realize like that was my seedling pot and that was important. Like that, like uh -huh. sheltering was important as I started growing. Yeah. Um, just as important as getting out of the pot later, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I think that that was something that has been important to me. Like, it's not that I'm leaving behind the stuff in my past. It's not that it's mm -hmm. not important or that I need to be embarrassed of it, that was part of my growth process. And the right. fact that I was wrestling meant that I really cared. People say, oh, mm -hmm. you're deconstructing for an excuse to sin, or you're rethinking your faith because you just want to like do whatever you want. And I think if you're really wrestling, that's a sign that that's not the reason. It, <laughs> like, it matters. If, yeah. If you just wanted to sin, you just find an excuse and you wouldn't wrestle with it and you'd move on. You know, <laughs> like it's a sign that this matters to you. Yeah. And that wrestling is part of the journey, like Jacob wrestling with God. And then he walks away with a limp. And mm. I love that. And for me, I feel like that in my life is kind of like walking away with humility to mm. say, like, we don't all have to think the same. I'm not always going to be right. Like, mm -hmm. it's not about that anyway. It's about mm -hmm. loving God, others and ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think like there's 
feeling of fear and discomfort is so normal and it's not a sign of being deceived. Honestly, like for some of us, we've come out of Christian bubbles that were borderline cult like. They had a lot of similarities to like yeah. the outside world is dangerous. You should be afraid yeah. of it. You should be afraid mm-hmm. of anyone who thinks it all differently. Like even this other mm-hmm. denomination over here, they're not real Christians, you know? Like right. there's a lot right. of cult like stuff. And the psychology of that, like Brittany yeah. Moses talks about, is that you're going to feel a lot of discomfort and fear moving out of it. Plus, the stakes are very high. If you don't believe mm. exactly the right thing, you're going to hell. That, those are high stakes. So of course you're going to be freaked out, you know, right. like it's scary, but sure. that doesn't mean it's not worth it. And it uh, does get better. And I feel like the freedom and the joy and the peace that I have found after wrestling mm-hmm. for like, it felt like that wrestling process that was really scary was like four mm-hmm. years long. And I was like, am mm-hmm. I doing this wrong? You know, like mm-hmm. God protect mm-hmm. me, but God is big enough to protect us. Like yeah. we are in his hands and we are not being snatched out, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and so the fear and discomfort is so normal. It's not a sign of a slippery slope or being deceived or anything like that. It's just normal. And it just keep pushing through it and you're not alone. So yeah, that's what I would say. I think it's too, like the the whole slippery slope thing is that if you are in contact with God in prayer and, and you're in connection, you're not just running rogue. Mm-hmm. You're like, well, I think I'll just yeah. do whatever I want. Yeah, that can right. happen. We can do yeah. And, yeah. and God will receive us back. But then mm-hmm. in, in a quest for a deeper understanding and deeper connection with God, if God is with us in this whole process, how could we go wrong? Because we, yeah. we are journeying with God together. We're not going mm-hmm. rogue. We're like, mm-hmm. t- teach me more of your ways tell me more of who you are and that yeah. could, that will involve other historic perspectives or other mm-hmm. you know influences that are just outside of our understanding but i wanted to tell you this too that this has been something that i stumbled on because of karen armstrong and i don't know if you are oh, yeah. aware of her work you know she was a nun uh-huh. for a while and then but one of the things she said that was so brilliant that i actually uh used in dialogue conversation with people that I, that I love, but that are, have been maybe spiritually abused. They have had a relationship or something with God and they're kind of like, done. Mm. they'll sit because they'll decide what God is like, right? Mm. That they, the transplant didn't happen. They just let it wither. And I'll mm-hmm. say what, what Karen said, which is we usually find about out about God and Santa Claus at the same time. <sighs> right. And we, don't get upset that Santa Claus, we don't stay mad about Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we're, we're 25 and we're like, Oh, Santa. (laughs) but we get mad that God didn't turn out. Like we thought, why didn't God fix everything? Why didn't, why didn't this happen? And she says that our, we'll be mature in our understanding about Santa Claus, but we'll stay like five years old with our understanding about God sometimes. And that that also has to mature. And we should, Mm -hmm. we should be thinking about them in similar ways. If, if our idea of, about God stays elementary level, you know, mm. primary school level, sort of sad reflection, because mm. even our ideas of Santa Claus are going to stay there. You know, mm. we're going to realize, hey, you know, I could be a Santa Claus to somebody. Wouldn't mm-hmm. that be fun? And I could be generous. And, mm. and, um, and I thought, what an interesting way to think about our journey with God as like, don't give up on it just because Mm -hmm. if you're mad at God about something, Mm -hmm. it's probably understandable, but maybe look at it again, look at your relationship again and think, is there anything childish about this Mm -hmm. that might be a little unsophisticated that might need some injection of new ideas that are more robust and dynamic. Mm -hmm. Um, That's what, deconstructing or transplanting will offer in this refreshment and something that's been really helpful for me is therapy like i found a counselor i was like i want a counselor who is a christian but who doesn't do christian counseling like he's actually like just his regular therapy but he gets where i'm coming from that was like my preference Mm -hmm. so i found this person he used to be a very um conservative pastor and then he started saying wait these women have all these gifts in my church and they can't 
be a deacon or an elder? Like, Mm. that doesn't make sense. And he started like looking into it more and changing a lot of his theology. And now he's much more, um, has a much bigger approach to Christianity. Anyway, I love him. My husband goes to him too. We are obsessed with him. Um, (laughs) But he walking through this and having meetings with him was huge because mm-hmm. he would just kind of push back at my fears, be like, mm-hmm. I'm so uncomfortable with this. Well, why? Because I have to know the answer. Why do you have to know the answer? Mm. Why does God really ask that of you? It just like pushed back at my fears yeah. and that helped me feel safer, but also challenged and help me like kind of think through some of the fears and realize like, these are not necessarily fears I have to have. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I highly recommend counseling to therapy. Yeah. It's great. But that challenge. It's like a coach will be like, you can, you can yeah. go to the next step. You can, your muscles can be sore the next day. You're not going to die from that. And, yes. and also like the challenge of bringing you out more into what's possible. Yeah. You know, it's, it's similar with spiritual direction. Yeah, because um, that's is what something, you do, right? It's I'm I do more companioning. It, it, direction is is really similar, but the the big difference is it's not therapy. So it's not mm-hmm. looking at pathologies and problems and mm-hmm. wounds in the same kind of way that therapy is extremely important. And mm-hmm. if I'm working with someone who has something that it it comes up again and again, like okay, that's a wound that's going to need therapy. I'm just mm-hmm. walking with you through things and asking good questions, calling you out, and then mm-hmm. we can pray about it or do a practice. Yeah. That's kind of free. That can happen for your whole life. It mm-hmm. doesn't. Yeah. And, and therapy is, it can be for your whole life too, but it's also mm-hmm. for like specific instances or wounds. Yeah. They're yeah. both excellent. But the idea of just having someone else that mm-hmm. is trained and safe and loving towards you, it's not about their agenda or their time or their yeah. stories. <laughs> right. And they have, this time is, is your sacred time. The benefit of that is, is just tremendous. It can be mm. so life-changing. Yeah, it really can. So that's, that's yeah. wonderful uh, that I, I'm so glad that therapy has become normalized to so I many know. people that it's not like this like I know my mom would like whisper if someone's getting they should take therapy. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I someone did that in the, in like the boomer the boomer crowd and I said that's awesome and they're like oh! and I said they must need it and want it it'll probably be good for them. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm glad yeah. I've had it. Mm-hmm. And um we've had to have it because the boomers did this to us. <laughs> <laughs> If they had gotten it we might not need so much. But it's <laughs> but it's like it's it's a friendship in a sense that mm. can not happen in, in other ways. Um, maybe there was a time, I don't know when, but maybe there was a time that that was possible in the world to have that sort of relationship that would draw you out in healthy ways like that. Mm. I don't know how you can get it in, in such a fast paced world at this point, mm. unless your, your life is so slowed down and so intentional. It's possible, mm. just really unlikely. Mm you know, that you have somebody trained and with the time to spend with you. And it's so important too, because especially growing up in conservative Christianity, especially with those fears of the outside world that can be so cult-like in such a small bubble, Mm. it's very hard to see outside that. It's very hard to see objectively and things feel normal even when they were not normal. And so I think that therapy can show you like, oh, that wasn't healthy. That wasn't normal. Like that wasn't true. Right. Even though it seemed that way, because that's all you've ever known. So exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You hear the same thing over and over and you don't realize Mm -hmm. you're swimming in this water Mm. and someone's like, but that's not normal water. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's filthy. You're like, what? (laughs) Yeah. I can't see. It's like, yeah, but like, like the whole thing you, you talk about purity culture. I think this is really important because our, our society does this to us to a degree not purity Mm -hmm. culture but the idea of the body being i mean for christians i guess the body is like an entry point to sin or the body can be like the body can be done wrong how we see it but in the world Mm -hmm. it's kind of the body can be used as a tool of power to manipulate and Mm -hmm. it's not great either so Mm -hmm. you know how do we think of our bodies this is a tricky tricky thing so we're Mm -hmm. not getting a lot of good messages from the religious types or from the secular types we're Mm. getting confusing stuff about our worth about how we're embodied and yet this is how we show up in the world with a body and so that's Mm -hmm. that is another tricky one that 
that we might have a lot of wounds and therapy would be important to say, Mm -hmm. have you thought of it this way? Or this is, this was unhealthy. That was unhealthy. Have you thought of it this way? Mm. And there'll be, there'll be, I'm sure you've felt this too. Like eureka moments where you're like, oh yeah. Okay. Wow. I had never considered that Mm -hmm. and healing moments. Yeah. It's so powerful. (laughs) Well, where are the best places people can find you to dig in more? What is the YouTube channel, but also websites and stuff too? Yeah. So my YouTube channel is Tiffany Dawn. It's um, relationship advice you don't hear in church. You'll see some of my older videos are a little more conservative leaning. And some of my older ones just kind of are exploring different ideas and understandings of the Bible, but they all kind of come back to the idea of healthy relationships with yourself, with God and with your significant other. Mm -hmm. Um, Then my Instagram, I just kind of post personal stuff and yeah, that's Tiffany Dawn IQB. And then I have four books. Um, I have The Insatiable Quest for Beauty about body image and Boy Crazy and How I Ended Up Single and Mostly Sane. Those are my older books. My newer books are Before the Ring, which is a premarital, premarital workbook to figure out if you guys are have a healthy relationship and are compatible. Mm-hmm. And also the Dating Couples Devotional Journal, which really can use with married, dating, engaged. But it's um, a devotional to work through as a couple that's Um, I try to have it not be cheesy. Um, And so those are my books. Um, And then my podcast is Outgrowing the Good Christian Girl. And you can find that on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. That uh, season three comes out June 1st. Right. When this comes out, season three will be available. So I hope everybody tunes in for that. That'll be really an exciting season to come. I know. I'm excited. This has been great. Thank you so much for sharing with us and joining us today. Thank you. I loved it.